And if you, if you young people will let, if you'll, if you'll, if you'll keep a soft heart towards God and let Him shape you, my soul, what God could do with you, what God could do with just the young people that are in this room. You know, there were, there were just twelve apostles that started a work that God said turned the world upside down. And there's, there's more than that here. And I want you all to listen to the preaching. And, and, and you've had so much preaching this week. I know that. But sometimes it's not focused on, you know, on your age group. And, and we want to give you an opportunity to have that during the week. And uh, I met Brother Gary and Amen um, last, was it last year? And uh, he came to the, the camp meeting. We got to know each other a little bit. He is uh, an evangelist out of Arkansas. Arkansas. He was a pastor for five years. A youth pastor, excuse me, for five years in Alabama and is an evangelist in, in Arkansas now. And uh, he has a heart for young people. And I know he's been praying and thinking about what the Lord would have him to give to you today. And I want you to, I want you to open up your hearts and listen uh, to the Word of God here for just a few moments. I know you're probably tired and you, you did a good job being engaged in the games and that was a lot of fun. And so let's try to Try to do our best to sit up, stay awake here for a little bit. And Brother Gary, and I'm so glad that you came to be with us today. And I'm looking forward to uh, what the Lord has given you to give these young people. Why don't you come and preach for us here this afternoon? Amen. Thank you, Preacher. Appreciate it. And it sure is good to be here this afternoon. Appreciate, Preacher, the opportunity to be here. Love Camp Calvary. And very thankful to be here for the opportunity to preach. And uh, we're very, very thankful for that. I can't help but think because I was a youth pastor and I had some twisted games myself, and we thought about the games. I'll tell you one quick story before we get into the message. I was preaching in a youth camp in Huntsville, Missouri, and I got to be in the dorms over there with the young people, and Bo Jonathan, he knows he's been over there, and uh, I had the cool kids, the older kids, if you would, and uh, they were the mischievous ones. They were the ding-dongs, if you would, and you guys know what Takis are, right? You know what Takis are. Well, there was this one brilliant young feller named Houston. And he comes up to another guy and says, Yo, check what I got here. He's got this Taki, sticks it in the between of his toes. And you can probably figure out what I'm about to tell you. He says, I bet you 20 bucks you won't eat this and suck it from my toes. And I'm like, no, don't do it. But they're like, eat it, eat it, eat it. And lo and behold, he bends down, he munches, he crunches, and sucks it up. Hey, won that 20 bucks. And that's why I love young people. You don't know what they're about to do. But yeah, that's... <laughs> all right, I'm glad no one did that today. But man, in all seriousness, we're so glad to be here today. Preacher, thank you once again. It's an opportunity to be here uh, we'll go to 1 Chronicles chapter 17, if y'all would. 1 Chronicles chapter 17. One of the preachers was preaching on David, and I was sweating bullets because the worst thing for a preacher here is uh, a similar passage that you think they're going to preach on, but thankfully he didn't preach what I'm going to preach on today. But 1 Chronicles 17, and we'll try and uh, give you what the Lord's laying our heart, and we'll take a rest for a little while. 1 Chronicles 17, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass... As David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. Then Nathan said to David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel unto this day, but have gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. I want to direct your attention to verse number 4. Notice what the Bible says. Go and tell David my servant, thus saith the Lord, notice these next three words, Thou shalt not. Father, we love you this afternoon. It sure has been good to be here. Lord, I love young people. It's a wonderful privilege to be around these people, Lord. I'm so very thankful for these young people. Lord, my style of preaching, my outline... My jokes, my illustrations, Lord, none of that is going to get the job done this afternoon. What we need is to hear from heaven, Lord. I pray you calm my nerves, Lord. Help me to say everything you want me to say. 
Help me to not say anything I shouldn't say. Lord, this is not my pulpit. Lord, help me be mindful of that, Lord. I thank you for all that you do, Lord. Would you please just fill us with the Spirit, fill the preacher with the Spirit, fill the listeners with the Spirit. Would you let the seed of the Word of God fall upon good ground this afternoon? We love you. We'll be very careful to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. In the life of David, no doubt we find throughout the Word of God that David has made many decisions and choices in his life. Decisions are a part of life, and every decision we make can have various consequences upon our lives, especially as young people. Y'all are fixing to start to make decisions in your life that are going to impact you for the rest of your life. I like what Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I think it should go without saying that would be a good choice for y'all to say, I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what anybody else may do. And there's probably not a better example of the impact of one's choices and decisions than the life of David. By way of introduction, some of David's decisions have ended in prosperity. We know that David did some mighty and amazing things for the Lord. In 1 Samuel 17, when he took down Goliath, he did not come in the confidence of the flesh. He didn't look at himself and say, I can do this, I got this. But all of his faith, all of his trust was in Almighty God. I'm going to need some good amens here today. When you decide to put your decisions based upon serving God and living God, you're going to have some success this afternoon. Not only do we find that some of David's decisions have ended in prosperity, but they've also ended in problems as well. We know David did a lot of great things, but we know David, unfortunately, did not make some good choices in his life. In 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven, 27, we heard about David and Bathsheba this morning. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. When you make choices that are going to please God, you're going to have some success. But on the flip side of that, when you make choices that are going to please yourself and please your sin, you are going to have nothing but failure. But one of the main things, preacher, that I love about David is that he knew how to get right with God. He might have made some mistakes, just as you might have made some mistakes here, young people, but aren't you glad that God is still loving and gracious and is more than willing to forgive you of your sins? If we confess our sins, He is faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Thank God that we serve a God who will forgive us when we make the wrong choice. But now I want to get to the thought of the message. We see some of David's decisions have ended and resulted in prosperity and problems, but they've also resulted in plans and preparations. In verse number 1 in our text, the Bible says, Now it came to pass, as David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. We find that David makes a choice, he makes a decision to plan to build a house for the Ark of the Covenant. Now on the surface, this seems like it's a good idea. Man, he's wanting to serve God. Man, he's wanting to make a choice to serve God. Man, I'm all for it. But in verse number 4, we find that the Lord had something else in mind. In verse number 4, the Bible says, Go and tell David my servant, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not. I'll be honest, I'm the kind of person who does not like to be told no. I'm the kind of person that doesn't like when my plans have been changed. I want to stick to the plan. I want to stick according to the plan, just go what my plan was. And David, he had a good track record. He made some mistakes here and there. And his plan was to do something for God. But the Lord says, no, that's not what I want you to do. How many of y'all could agree that you had your plans, you had your goals, you had your decisions, you had your preparations, but the Lord said, no, that's not what I want you to do. I can attest to that. I've been in evangelism for a year. I've been a youth pastor for a few years. I've had some changes in my life that I was not expecting, nor was I anticipating. 
But to go ahead and jump ahead of the message, I'm glad to tell you today that God's plans are much better than what your plans are this evening. Isaiah said it like this, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It doesn't matter how good your plan might sound or on paper how good it might look. You just go ahead and understand that God's plans are far better than what you got in mind. And life is full of decisions and choices that we have to make. And I believe, I, I know my crowd. I'm not talking to a bunch of lost, wicked, ungodly sinners. Most of y'all, if not all of y'all, are saved in church, in the ministry, trying to do right and live right. But how many of y'all can admit you've got it wrong a few times? Even when you're trying to serve God and you're trying to do right, sometimes we still get it wrong. With the hope of the Lord for just a few moments, I want to preach on this thought, a change in plans. A change in plans. It doesn't matter how good your plans might be, God's got a far better plan for you this afternoon. First of all, we see the opportunity. In verse number 1, Now it came to pass as David sat in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. We find that the Ark of the Covenant remained in the curtains of a tent. The Ark was an important fact, no doubt. It's something that the children of Israel held dearly. In fact, the Philistines were afraid of that thing whenever it came about. Hebrews tells us uh, that the, they held the Ten Commandments, the golden pot of man, Aaron's rod. And while the Ark of the Covenant was an actual, literal thing, it was a type of a picture of the power of God as well. I think we can all agree that all of us need the power of God in our life. Whether you're in the pew, whether you're in the pulpit, whether you're a lay person, whether you're a preacher, we need the power of God in our lives. We need it. Ephesians 3, 2 says this, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above, all that we ask according to the power that worketh in us. Aren't you glad that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think? And I don't blame David for wanting to get a hold of the power of God. I want the young people in this room to get a hold of the power of God, to be filled with the Spirit and just say, I'm going to serve God no matter what. And David sees an opportunity to have a part in the power of God and makes a plan to build a house for the Ark of the Covenant. But we find that just because an opportunity presented itself to David, that it didn't mean it was an opportunity for David to take. You know, young people, life is full of opportunities that you're going to face in just a few short years. Where are you going to go to college? Who are you going to marry? If you're going to go in the ministry, there's a lot of opportunities that are going to present themselves to you. But just because it presents itself to you doesn't mean that you're supposed to take it this evening. We see his heart. Now, I could be wrong on this, but preacher, I don't see a bad intent in David's heart in this passage. We know that David had messed up with David and Bathsheba. Obviously, his intents and motivations were wrong. But here, Brother Jonathan, I don't see any bad motivation from David in this passage, as far as I could tell. And David certainly messed up from time to time, but David had a great track record of being what we famously call him, a man after God's own heart. If anybody understood the heart of God, it was David. And you know, we talk about the will of God. And many times we talk about that specific will of God and that general will of God. And can I tell you that general will of God? There's some things that all of us as born again, saved believers, ought to be doing, every single one of us. All of us ought to be in this Bible. All of us ought to be praying. All of us ought to be soul winners. All of us ought to be faithful members of a local church. All of us ought to try our best to be a witness. There are some things that all of us, that general will of God that you and I are supposed to do. But a lot of times we're interested in that specific will of God. To pastor, to be in the ministry, to be a singer. And that's a good thing. But sometimes we focus so much on trying to get that specific will that we forget that general will. And can I tell you, if you do not do things that you know you're supposed to be doing, don't be surprised if God's not going to show you his specific will for your life. And sometimes we make the mistake of basing our decisions for the specific will of God on our heart being in the right place. And listen, I, I know I'm probably talking to some good young people here today. Most of y'all probably saying are trying to serve God, you're trying to do right. 
and, and you sought counsel, and you're doing the best that you can, you really think this, this is what God wants me to do with my life. Well, you know, you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. I know some people that really believe that the earth is flat. They're sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. I know some people that think LeBron James is the best basketball player of all time, but they're sincerely wrong. I know some people that think, man, that's the most handsome guy I've ever seen. I'm like, ladies, have you, are you sure about that? Have you really got your eyesight checked? I know some young people watch this. Man, the Lord's not called me to preach. He's not called me to the ministry, but in reality, he has. Or it could be the other way. Man, God's called you in ministry, but sometimes the Lord has not called you into that field. Your heart may be right this afternoon. Your heart's in the right place. You're trying to serve God, but just because it's in the right place, just because an opportunity presents itself to you, does not mean that's the opportunity that you're supposed to take. Not only see his heart, we see his help. Notice this in verse number 2. David wasn't alone. Then Nathan said to David, do all that is in thy heart, for God is with thee. We know Nathan is the prophet. David had the blessing of people who cared about him and wanted to help him. Aren't you glad that there are some people in our lives, whether it's a preacher, whether it's a youth pastor, whether it's our parents, that want to help us to deceive the honor and glory of God? And Nathan's like, go for it, David. Get on with your bad self. You just go ahead and do it. But then we find that Nathan got it wrong as well. I, I want to be very careful I say this. We got some people in our life that they mean well and they're trying to help us. Their intentions are right as well. But may I say, young people, another person does not determine that specific will of God in your life. Can I tell you a little secret? Sometimes we as preachers, we get it wrong sometimes. And our heart is in the right place, but sometimes because we're still human, we're still made of the same flesh as y'all are. We make mistakes as well. And how many times, Brother Jonathan, do we see people that are, they were mama called and papa sent into the ministry, and they failed in the ministry because they let them call them into it instead of letting God call them into it. And don't misunderstand me. You need your parents. You need your pastor. I'm not minimizing the importance of them. But adults, that's a good lesson for us as well. That if we really want to help the young people is to let the work of the Holy Ghost do its job as well. Go to John chapter 16, if you would, please. John chapter 16. Notice what Jesus has to say about the Holy Ghost, about the Spirit. There's multiple titles for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit of God. But in John 16, verse 13, the Bible says this. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. Can I tell you, I cannot tell you what that specific will of God, whether you're called to preach, whether you're called to be in the ministry, whether you're called to just uh, sit in a church, be a good, faithful servant of God, I cannot tell you what that uh, specific will is for your life. But the Holy Ghost of God can. And again, I'm for counsel, I'm for pastors and parents. Don't misunderstand me. But let God be the one to direct your life and determine what the will of God is for your life. And adults, if we really want to help someone, point them toward that general will of God, and then God eventually will show them, will show y'all the specific will of God in your life. Now do we see the opportunity. Man, there's, there's a good opportunity for David, but, but this wasn't the opportunity for him to take. But then we see, secondly, the opposition. David is no stranger to adversity and opposition. He's used to battles. He was used to a Goliath. He was used to a Saul. He was used to an Absalom. But the person standing in the way of his plans was none other than the Lord. Verse 4. Well, verse, thir uh, verse number 3. And it came to pass the same night, the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. If you're going to live for God, young people, there might be times the Lord is going to be the one to stop you and change your plans. He might put people in your life to direct you in which way you're supposed to go, but sometimes God himself is going to have to say, whoa, slow down there. 
I like what James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, don't mind it. You know, isn't it amazing that the God of heaven would want to have a fellowship with us, would want anything to do with us? If we draw nigh to him, he's going to draw nigh to us. And I believe sometimes in order for God to draw nigh to us, he's going to have to close that door. He's going to have to shut that door of opportunity in order to get a hold of your attention. We see the silence. Verse number 6 really supports uh, the fact that just because this was an opportunity, it wasn't for him to take. Verse 6, Wheresoever I have walked with all Israel, spake I a word to any of the judges of Israel, whom I command to feed my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedars? God did not tell David nor anybody at that point in time in order to build the temple. Nobody. We know that Solomon would go on to, his son would go to do that, and David would have a part in helping to build it, but God never told him to do it. And again, this brings me to my point. Sometimes we let other people try to tell us the will of God for our life. But if God's not speaking, young people, just leave it alone. Just leave it. Don't even fool around with it. You know, there's some people in my life that I absolutely admire. Daniel Waters is one of them. I, I've known him for years. He's been kind to me and advanced for years. I love to hear him preach. I'm like, man, Lord, I sure would like to preach like that. I hear him sing. I'm like, man, I sure wish I could sing and play like that. But you know what? I can't because I'm not Daniel Waters. I'm not Josh Lovins. I'm not Jonathan Lewis. I'm just Gary and John. Amen. That's what God called me to be. And I could take some things here and there, but listen, you know, if you try and compare yourself to somebody else, you are never, ever, ever going to be satisfied. Jonathan, who wouldn't want to preach like Tony Shirley and Cody Zorn? Who wouldn't want to preach like that? But, but God's called me to be me. And when I see someone else being used of God and what God's called them to do, man, man I want some of that. I wish I was like that. But you know, as long as you're obedient to God, that's really what matters. That's what really matters to whatever God's called you to do. And there might be times that God has got the... He, sometimes He won't even open doors for you. And sometimes He's going to have to shut those doors. And we keep trying to knock on that door, trying to open that door, and force our way through, and we are torturing ourselves, trying to answer a call that God has never called us to. If God is silent, so should you. We see he only his silence. We see the supply. The Lord reminds David that even though this wasn't what he was called to do, that David was not alone. In verse 7, Now therefore thus uh, shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, even from the following the sheep, that thou should be, shouldest be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with thee, with the sword thou hast walked, and have cut uh, cut off all thine enemies from before thee, and have made thee a name like the name of the great men that are in the earth. God reminds David of the victories in his life and reminds him that it's going to be A-OK. -okay. You know what's amazing in Jonah chapter 2, verse 7? Jonah is about as backslidden as a preacher as probably can find in the Bible. He's in the belly of a whale. That's how backslidden he was and how disobedient he was. But in the midst of that, he said, I remembered the Lord. And listen, sometimes the Lord makes changes to your plans, young people. Instead of griping, instead of complaining, saying, God, why can't I do that? Just be thankful that God would call you into anything, that God would save you, that God would just have anything to do with us. It's an amazing thought that the God of the universe... He spoke the world's existence. And Jess says, he made the stars also. Like, no big deal. He just made the stars. And yet he wants to do something in your life. It would be good for all of us to remember that God has never once let us down. Not once. If he could save your soul, Brother Cody, he could certainly make his will known unto you and meet and supply your needs then lastly and all God's people said amen we see the opportunity and the opposition there could be some opportunities for you and, and just because it's an opportunity doesn't mean you're supposed to take it there's some opposition and it's not always going to be the world the flesh and the devil sometimes it's going to be God himself saying 
No. But lastly, we see the optimism. The optimism. Verse number 11. And it shall come to pass when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house, and I will establish his throne forever. The Lord tells David that even though he wasn't called to build the house, God had something better in mind. But here's the thing, guys. He says a seed would go on. Solomon comes along. He was the wisest man to ever live. But we know we heard this morning that he messed up. He made some mistakes. In fact, the, the, the kingdom of Israel was, was split after the, the reign of Solomon. So Solomon's reign did not last forever. And all everybody else from the bloodline of David did not last. <laughs> but you know, there's another person that came from the line of David, a royal descendant of David in Matthew chapter 1 verse number 1 why don't you turn over there real quick Matthew 1 verse number 1 notice what the very first verse of your New Testament says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ the son of David David may not be able to build the house he may not have got to do what he wanted to do but he got something that was so much better than what he could have asked for he got to be in line with the king of kings and the lord of lords this afternoon he had something so much better in mind isn't it good to know even though god had to make a change to your plans man this is gonna be awesome my plans are gonna work the lord says you ain't seen nothing yet. Watch what I can do. And I'm telling you what, if you'll just surrender to God, if you'll just decide right here now, whatever it is God has called you to do, if you just go and do it, you'll be amazed at what God can do. Not what you can do, but what God can do. We see his response. You know, David could have easily stuck with his plans. He could have thrown a fit. He could have said, I'm going to stick to the plan. I'm going to do what I want to do. But he refused to be puffed up with pride. You know, isn't it funny that pride is supposed to puff us up, make us bigger and bigger and bigger than what we are? But in the end, it's going to put us flat on our face. Proverbs says that pride shall bring a man low. You know, that's the only time in the book of Proverbs that the word low is mentioned. And it's associated with pride. Young people, if you think, Man, I've got this under control. Who cares? It doesn't, I know God told me to do this, but I'm going to do this. It's not going to end well for you. You're just going to be brought low. And in verse number, uh, verse number 16, And David the king came and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is mine house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And yet this was a small thing in thine eyes, O God, for thou hast also spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come, and as regard me according to the uh, state of a man of high degree, O oh Lord God. David just goes out and brags on the Lord. He just brags, man, God, I don't know why on earth you called me into this. I don't know why you changed my plans, but you had a purpose for it. We love to quote Romans 8, 28. It says that all things work together for good. It doesn't say all things are good. It says all things work together for good. My mom had cancer. Three separate times. Cancer is not a good thing in of itself. But, God, but through that, God worked it together for me to see a woman that stood strong in the faith, that kept on, kept it on. We have two children. We're about to have our third child. Somebody pray for us. But there was a time we didn't know if we were ever going to have children. We kept trying and trying. Disappointment after disappointment. Miscarriages, losing children. That's not a good thing in of itself, but God worked it together. And even though I am thankful for my children now, I'm even more thankful considering what has God has brought my wife and I through. God may have to change some things in your life, young people, but I'm telling you, if you respond right, you'll be blessed for it. And then lastly, you see his reward. David was rewarded by living a good, long life. He made, yes, he made some mistakes. Yes, he messed up in some areas. But he still put his faith and trust in the Lord. He got the trust his kingdom to his son Solomon and he was going to have the Lord Jesus Christ the one who would die on Calvary the one who would shed his blood for our hell deserving sins that's what David got as reward 
But you know, there's another passage in which David is mentioned in, and it's in Hebrews chapter 11. What's Hebrews 11 known for? That great hall of faith. And no doubt in my mind, preacher, that faith was a big part of David's life, especially when God told him no. Some, man, if you really are going to try and serve God, young people, you need to have faith. And don't misunderstand about to say, I'm all for counseling, I'm all for trying to make good decisions, but sometimes we just need to stop trying to figure it out and just trust God. Proverbs says this, Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. It's going to be a change in plans. Can I tell you what? There's been some changes that made to my plans that I did not anticipate. I sure am glad I trusted him. I sure am glad that I just decided, you know what? I don't care what anybody else says. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not always going to succeed, but I'm going to do my best to live for God. Maybe here today you're lost. You've never been born again. You're, never, you're really never going to figure out the will of God if you've never been born again. That's the first step is to trust Jesus Christ to be born again. But I tell you what, sometimes those changes can be tough. They can be tough, but they're worth it. I want to end with one story and I'll be done. I feel bad after preacher uh, Josh talked about stories. I'm like, well, I got one. I'm sorry. But tell you one quick story and then I'll be done. I had the privilege to be a youth pastor in the great state of Alabama for almost five years. I loved every second of it. But toward the end of that ministry, the Lord was beginning to work in my wife and I's heart and say, you know, it's time, it's time to move on. I talked to my preacher at the time and we both agreed that it was time to move on. We st- we're still good mem- uh, standing with the church. We still love the church and all that stuff. Nothing bad, nothing wrong, nothing like that. But for a few months, Bo Jonathan, in 2023, I'll be honest, that was the most miserable year of my life. And I'm trying to find that specific will of God for my life. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to church. I got to preach whenever the opportunities come. I did the best that I could with what I had. Ever since the Lord saved me, I've always, always, always known that the Lord was going to call me into evangelism. And that was the obvious, correct choice, but for some reason I just said, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. And all my preacher friends and all the ordinary guys like, it seems like evangelism is in your heart. That seems what God's calling you to do. Why don't you just go ahead and do it? And I made every excuse that you can think of. I, I, I'm not old enough. I'm not well known enough. How is the bills going to get paid? How is this going to work out? And that was my basis of choosing the will of God instead of just trusting God. And there were several opportunities that were given to me. Go pastor a church, be on staff at church, be a youth pastor at church. None of those things were bad things. Nobody would have thought differently of me if I went to any of those other positions. But the Lord closed those doors and said, no, that's not it. Then finally, literally around about a year ago, I, said, I, told, I looked at my wife and said, I guess we're going to evangelism. That's a great attitude to have. I guess I'm going to do this. And I did accept, I knew that the Lord was going to call me to evangelism. I knew that. I've always known that. But listen, there's a big difference, young people, in accepting a call and surrendering to a call. I'm doing the best I can and Meetings weren't coming. Reading my Bible, like Preacher Angel was talking about, the zone of silence, man, no, nothing, absolutely nothing, dead in my Christian life. Then finally I go to a church in Houston, Texas, Shady Acres Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, one of my favorite places in the world. And I'm a young evangelist. I'm tw- I was 27 last year, but just trying to do what I could. I heard a preacher by the name of Terrence Calvin preach on this thought. Don't let there be a question mark on you. Is there a question mark on you, young people? You know what God's called you to do, but you're still just saying, 
I, I can't do this. I'm too young. How, how, are these go, how is this going to work out? Like I said. The preacher, other than the day that the Lord saved me, I don't think there was a more convicting day in my life. The Holy Ghost said, you need to get that altar. And I go to the altar. I do what I'm supposed to do. The Lord said, are you going to finally trust me? Are you going to finally surrender to me? And I'm, oh, God. How is this going to work out? How am I going to pay the bills? How is my family going to be okay? Making the same excuses that I kept making for myself. The Lord finally said, but Ben, when are you just going to stop playing games and just accept it and surrender to it? I said, all right, Lord. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how on earth I'm going to be able to make it through. But Lord, this is what you call me to do. And I surrender to it. So August of last year, I fully surrendered to be an evangelist. And I'm just having the time of my life. I'm meeting some great friends. That Friday was my daughter's birthday. And I was going to go home and just see my, my family, just spend the time with her. But the Lord said, why don't, you just, why don't you just stay? At least for the morning service. But the Lord, it's in Houston, Texas. It's hot. I'm ready to get back home and see my family. The Lord said, just your shirt, shirt and tie on, get your Bible and, and go. All right. I get there, I'm sitting in the front pew, just enjoying the service, and all of a sudden I hear my name being called up. And you better believe my prayer life got uh, real good real quick that day because of how terrified I was to be in front of all those people. I got to preach, had a time in my life, I was excited. My faith was at an all time high. But then, there, at, at Shea Acres, if you've been there, some of y'all have been there, there are missions-minded church. And they, they really try to help missionaries and struggling people out. There was a brother there from the Carolinas that was trying to plant a church. He needed like $17,000. The church raised $15,000 of it. And the Lord <laughs> came to me and said, why don't you give 100 i I'm like, there, you must have the wrong guy. There must be another Gary and Amen somewhere. Because I ain't got $100. I might have enough money just to get home. The Lord said, give $100. I, I ain't got it. Give $100. No, give it. No. You ever argue with the Lord? It doesn't end well. The Lord finally said, give it up, boy. I'm like, I'll give 100 and I honestly did not have the money. I, could, I didn't have it. And I was about to talk to the preacher and say, I'll write a check. I'll, I'll, I'll figure something out. But before I could reach the preacher, a couple that I've never met in my entire life from North Carolina, Steve and Susie Helper, came up to me, talked with me, and said, how much they appreciated me. They gave me a good Baptist handshake with some money in it. Any of y'all want to take a wild guess of how much money was in my hands? One hundred dollars. God came through once again. Even though my faith had failed once again, he still said, watch this. And he went exceeding abundantly above all I could ask or think. I could tell you story after story after story, young people, of how I did not know how the bills were going to be paid, how the next meal was going to come. But God came through every single time. Probably you're here today, you know what God's called you to do. Even though you're young, God can still speak to young people. He can show you his perfect will. But maybe you're here today. You know what God's called you to do, and you're just wrestling with it. It might be to be in the ministry. It might be to preach. It might be to sing. It might be whatever. But can I tell you, I've said so many times already, but God's plans are far, far better than what your plans are today. Maybe if you're not saved, he really, the only thing you need to do is just trust Christ. Just get born again. That's the first step. I'm telling you what, if there was a better life out there, 
I would be in it. That's what I would be doing. David said, is there not a cause? Man, for 21 years of my, I was born January 31st, 1996. But August 24th, 2017, at Victory Baptist Church in Benton, Arkansas, that's when I really started living. I gave my heart and life to Jesus. And i am still got a lot to learn, preacher. I'm not a seasoned man of God by any stretch of the imagination. But I've come to find that God takes care of his youngins today. He's a good God. He might have to change your plans, but I promise you, it's a far better life than what you've got in mind. Father, we love you today. It sure has been good to be here, Lord. I pray that the message was a help, Lord. To God and direct, help and bless, Lord, this invitation. Lord, speak to hearts. Bless this church. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Preacher. Phenomenal message, young people. God does change our plans. And I think some of you have probably gone through some things recently where you thought this, this, might, be the, this might be the path that I'm on. It might, might be a relationship. It might, might be a career choice. Maybe you thought you were called to do something. I think it's, I think it's interesting. David had it in his heart. And Nathan said unto David, do all that is in thine heart. But they hadn't quite yet sought God on it. And it seemed like such a good thing. The opportunity was there. It made sense, right? And sometimes, young people, you get the idea that, well, because there seems to be an open door, this must be the Lord's will. But the only way to really know if it is is to surrender your life and your will to God and wait and give him time to reveal whether it is or not. Give him time to close that door or keep it open. They just hadn't gone to God about it yet. It seemed like the right thing. Young people, you're going to have to decide. that It doesn't really matter what I see or what I think is the right direction. Your mind might line up with God's heart, but the only way to know is to be in total surrender to God's will and let him have it. It's the only way you'll ever be truly fulfilled. It's the only way you'll be truly happy. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message that we've heard. I pray that you would please help these people to be responsive, these young people to be responsive to what they've heard. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder how many of you would say, as Brother Garion was preaching, the Lord began to speak to my heart about surrendering my will to the Lord and letting Him have all of it. I wonder if you'd slip your hand in the air and say, God spoke to my heart about that. I need to surrender my will. All right, you can put your hands down. I wonder how many of you have ever come to a place where you've actually given the Lord all of it, your life, your direction, your decisions, and said, God, not my will, but thine be done. And I'm willing to wait on you to show me what that is. If you've never done that, you need to do that today. Right now. You need to do it today. He mentioned the fact that there may be some that are lost. I, I don't doubt it at all. Maybe you were listening to the preaching and God began to speak to your heart about your soul. Is everybody in here right now, are you, are you truly saved? You know it for a fact. If you were to die right now, you are 100% sure you would go to heaven. If that's the case, would you slip your hand in there? You say, preacher, I've got it settled. All right? You can put your hands down. Who's here today that would say, preacher, if I were to die right now, I do not know 100% certain that I would go to heaven, but I'd like to know. Would you please pray for me? Would you slip your hand in there? I'd like to pray for you. I see that hand. Somebody else? Somebody else? You can put your hand down. Wonderful. Say, preacher, that's me. I don't know. If I were to die today, I don't know if I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know. Would you please pray for me? Would you slip your hand in there? I'd like to pray for you. Somebody else? I see that hand. You can put your hand down. Wonderful. Young person, if you just raised your hand and said you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, you need to get it settled before we leave this service. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an invitation time and give you an opportunity to spend some time with God. If God spoke to your heart about anything, maybe something that I didn't mention, maybe something that Brother Garion didn't mention, 
but God spoke to your heart. You need to be responsive. Young person, you need to surrender your will to God. Are you in total surrender in your life? God's plan may not fit your plan. You might have a desire in your heart, and it's not God's heart for you. You've got to be in total surrender. Let's have the music begin to play, and let's all stand to our feet. If God